Hello, this is Faith at Faith and Books, and I am 26% into the rise and fall of the Third Reich, um, according to my Kindle. So I thought I would take a few minutes to just recap it, um, because it's a, it's a long work, and uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in it, um, a lot of issues, especially initially, uh, one of the questions the author has is just how could this have happened? Um, how could Hitler have happened? And so it was very thought provoking. And um, he kind of wants to, I mean, he explains this political situation, all the, all the different things that were going on with the Weimar Republic and uh, the, the sanctions of the Versailles Treaty and that sort of thing. But he also wants to blame the German people. And um, I have a little bit of problems with that. Not that I don't think that, you know, we can be morally culpable. I mean, we definitely are morally culpable for the evil that we do. Um, but I do think that it's, uh, it's an aspect of society uh, that these terrible things happen. And they've really been going on I mean, if you study history, uh, you know that um, it's really an anomaly to have a peaceful and free society. And most of the time in our history, it hasn't been like that. Um, um, I think I mentioned before, I read this uh, History of the Ancient World, and it was just basically one city-state or one empire trying to take over other uh, city-states or territories or empires. and um, you know, it was all about uh, battles and, and um, taking slaves. Uh, e the economic system was based on slavery. So it's, you know, I think from our perspective, it seems like really puzzling how it could happen because we have grown up in a, a relatively stable and free society. Um, and so it seems... Um, and, I mean, and it is evil, but it seems so um, absurd almost that that anything like that can ha that anyone could think that way or let something like that happen, and yet it really is um, more of the norm for the human condition than what we're currently uh, experiencing. Um, so anyway, so um, the um, the author wrote this book. His name is William Shire. And uh, he must have spoke, spoken German. Uh, he was a war correspondent who was stationed in Berlin and then later Vienna. And I think later he, he goes to Czechoslovakia, maybe. Um, but until he was, I think he was finally booted out by the Third Reich, maybe in 1940. I'm not, I can't, I don't remember exactly when he gets the boot, but it's because he, you know, he's a pretty courageous guy who reported the facts. Uh, in fact, the first time I think he says he got in trouble was when he reported that for the 1936 Olympics, um, he wrote a story about how they were taking down the uh, no Jews allowed or Jews forbidden or whatever signs for when um, the other countries were going to come for the Olympics, and he got in trouble for that. Um, anyway, he just happened to be at the epicenter and he went to many uh, Hitler rallies and he interviewed people um, that were pretty high up. So he really knew what was going on um, as, as Hitler rose in power. Um, so he starts off with um, Hitler's childhood. Hitler, for one thing, Hitler wasn't his name when he was born. His father adopted that name, I think. Somehow, uh, his father adopted the name Hitler. He was born with his long, awkward, uh, slightly goofy-sounding uh, last name, and uh, the father uh, changed the name to Hitler, which was a name that was in another branch of the family. Uh, it had various spellings, but they they uh, settled on Hitler. Um, and so the, the author wonders, you know, if he had had this goofy long name, would it have been the same? You know, it didn't, doesn't, didn't have the same ring as Heil Hitler. Um, anyway, um, 
so, and he was sort of born in sort of a backwater area of Austria. His family, his, his parents were second cousins, and apparently there was a lot of intra-family marriage in that area. And um, it wasn't his father's first marriage. His father was older. His father was a civil servant, and he wanted Hitler to go into the civil service, but Hitler didn't want to. But his father died when he was, you know, whatever the equivalent name for high school is, uh, when, when uh, Hitler was in his teens, his mid-teens, I think. And, um, then the, uh, um, and then he dropped out of school. And uh, he didn't work. He seemed to have um, sort of uh, just, you know, sat around and read stuff that inspired him to be nationalistic and racist. Um, and just mooched off his mother. But then his mother died, I think, when he was in his very early 20s. And eventually he ran out of family members to mooch off of. So he moved to Vienna and he did low skill, menial labor. He might have drawn um, advertisements for pamphlets that they used to put out. Uh, that stores would put out to sell furniture and that sort of thing. He tried to get into art school. He wanted to be an architect, but you had to have finished high school or whatever they call that school, their secondary school. Um, um, so he couldn't do that, but then he found out that you could get into the general art program without that degree. So he tried, and of course he was famously rejected. Um, so he was just sort of lost and floundering. He didn't seem to have many friends, but he was odd. He, he uh, lived in these low rent boarding houses. Uh, he was very poor, but he, um, he never smoked. He didn't drink. He didn't womanize. Uh, he just sort of kept to himself and he, he tended to read um, a lot of anti-Semitic newspapers, which seemed to be abounding in Vienna at that time. And then uh, World War I came along and it kind of saved him. He, he went into the army, he went to fight in France, and he sort of found um, you know, a place where he fit in better. Although he didn't really um, make a lot of friends or anything, although some people, he did make some connections. But he won a Medal of Honor somehow for bravery. Um, I wish the author knew, maybe he just didn't have the, the uh, resources. Um, I'd like to know what his experience in France was like. Um, I wonder how formative that was because he was such a brutal man, though he didn't seem to do his own killing. He seemed to have other people, but he was so heartless um, and ruthless. I wonder, I wonder if uh, his, I mean, he might've already had that bent anyway. And I just wonder how the war experience maybe, um, you know, furthered that tendency. Um, but anyway, after the war um, and the Versailles Treaty, which really, really uh, dealt quite a blow to the German people, um, he stayed in the army, and that's how he got involved in the Nazis. Because, so the position of the army at that time isn't the same as it is in the U.S., where we really have a division. Um, for some reason, the army was in charge of going around checking out political parties, um, which just seems so odd. We would never have that happen here. Um, but the army had like a, a very different position. And this is why I think he's, the author's a little bit unfair because I feel like he's coming from a very American, um, you know, a very American place and how we view the role of government everything, whereas I feel, it seems like the the Germans didn't have this organic understanding of a republic government, because that wasn't their history. And in fact, the most, the, the closest in time uh, era of glory for the German people was the Prussian Empire, which was very materialistic. And so, um, that was their background. That was their political experience and heritage. Um, and so the, the Weimar Republic was kind of foisted on them and the Kaiser was forced to abdicate um, by the, you know, the allies who won World War I. Um, 
And it, that, to me, when you force that on a country, it's, it doesn't take. You know, it reminded me of like a colonial powers that when they left, they sort of superimposed this republic form of government. And then, you know, it just doesn't take well. It doesn't, you can't have the transfer of power peacefully and it, it tends to break down. I think it's because it just isn't indigenous or organic to those people. As good as it is, and you know, I'm somebody who likes republic form of governments, but um, but it's if it isn't natural to the people and their history and their heritage and the way they view themselves, and um, then it's hard for them to adopt. And you might have some people who are sort of forward thinking who adopt it, but there's a lot of people who are longing for the glory days of the past, or they don't quite get it. Like one thing they really didn't get. Uh, besides having the army check out political parties, the army, because it was the only institution that really remained from you know the former days uh, before the Versailles Treaty, it sort of had a, it held a special place in the minds of Germans. Um, so it was just a different attitude towards the military. Um, but also, wait, what was I going to say? Um, Oh, but the other thing is that they, you know, the, the Weimar Republic was very, um, there were lots of parties. And this, this author keeps saying, um, you know, there were too many parties that made them unstable. But I think you can have a lot of parties that have to learn to, to get along so they can form coalitions because you wind up just always having to vote for two choices, right? Everything always boils down to two choices, no matter how many um, parties you've got, um, they have to be willing to partner up in order to get more seats in the legislature and that sort of thing. But but the, the parties had their own militia, so like that's where the SA came from for the Nazis. They had their own militia. They're they're stormtroopers, and other parties did too. And it wasn't so that when you were campaigning, a lot of times they would break out into riots because you would have these armed people, these thugs, um, all set up to, to fight each other. So that's crazy, of course that's destabilizing. Parties should not have their own militia. That should have been outlawed. So they didn't quite get the idea of political parties. Um, it just That just seems so crazy to me that that was allowed. The Communist Party too had, had their own militia and their own like type stormtroopers that would go in and deliberately threatened and beat up, people got murdered. And it was just crazy. And so uh, you can see why the common person who maybe isn't that politically involved would just be tired of democracy because democracy is just, you know, people. And then they would, they would constantly be having new elections because they were facing all these crises because of the economy and, you know, the fact that the, the, uh, the sanctions against Germany were so harsh, it really through the whole um, society into a real crisis. So no wonder they weren't that gung-ho about it. I mean, it just, it was endless, uh, you know, violence and turbulence and uncertainty. Um, so it just didn't, they didn't quite grasp the idea. Um, and they were so isolated. Um, you know, the, it really was, uh, the Versailles Treaty really was a bad treaty. It really did scapegoat the Germans in a way that was very destructive. And of course, we learned from that in World War II. We went in and tried to help uh, Germany and, and Japan. So, so at least we learned from that, at least in that one particular instance. Um, so anyway, so what else was I going to say? Um, so anyway, um, so... Um, Hitler finds out about the Nazi party, which was named something else. They renamed it when he uh, was on assignment with the army to check out various parties. And he just, it was a very small, inconsequential party, but he saw potential because he had already formed these crazy ideas. That was another thing that really surprised me because, you know, I knew somewhat about Hitler. I, read books and studied history and watched documentaries and stuff like that. But um, I, I guess I 
didn't realize just how open he was about his plan, about his crazy nationalism, and about his virulent anti-Semitism. Uh, and he was really open about it. I mean, people knew what they were getting when, that, when Hitler was elected which is kind of scary. But at the time, they're really, he was so manipulating the system. And nobody, I think people just couldn't imagine somebody that evil. I mean, he, he was just an evil genius. And, um, and so I think they just kept hoping for the best or just sort of were in denial, saying, oh no, it couldn't be that bad. But also there were just these really bad cultural things going on. There was this crazy nationalism. Um, and there was this uh, horrible anti-Semitism, which of course has been around for forever, but, um, but it seemed to be reaching a peak around that area, not just in Germany though, but it was, in, it was all over. And, and it was sort of, um, it was the old anti-Semitism kind of combining with um, social Darwinism. And, uh, and even in this country, in the, in the teens, in the 19 teens, and the 1920s and 30s, that's when you have eugenesis, um, and you have um, the, the KKK was really big. Um, you know, it, it was all over. The racism um, and the nationalism was, was all over the world. It was just that in Germany, it was sort of, there was other things <coughs> excuse me, going on that sort of created a perfect storm and and, the, and then they had Hitler. Sorry, <clears throat> I suddenly got a tickle in my throat. <clears> throat. And then they had Hitler who was, um, you know, had this, had this grandiose dream of, of being, um, you know, the fewer leading uh, the German nation into uh, the great Third Reich that was going to be, you know, the greatest nation in the world. Um, and that's the other thing. He was called the Fuhrer from the beginning. Before he was ever Chancellor or anything, he was called the Fuhrer in the Nazi party. And he told them, you know, point blank, he was going to be dictator and he was going to rule the world. I mean, he was going to rule Germany, um, uh, the, you know, with this particular vision. So first he tried to do it through the, how do you say it, Pooch, Putsch, P-U-T-C-H, I should know this, I took German in high school, and I don't remember how to pronounce anything, um, but the Beer Hall Putsch, um, where he tried to um, stage a coup, uh, and that didn't work, and he wound up going to prison for, I think, I think it turned out to just be five months, so they weren't, you know, they didn't, they weren't that harsh about uh, doing things like that. It was a very volatile, unstable time. Um, but then he, that's when he wrote Mein Kampf, which is another thing I don't understand. He dictated Mein Kampf. Who's in prison and is able to dictate something? It just seemed really, like, <laughs> I don't know. I think that's kind of a privilege. Um, uh, he, he didn't have to write it out himself. He could, somebody could come and visit him and he could dictate it to them. Um, uh, um, anyway, so that's when he wrote Mein Kampf. Um, and then, um, and in Mein Kampf, he, I know I've never read Mein Kampf. Um, but in that book, he, he pretty much lays out everything he wants to do. So it was out there. Now it was, you know, it, it was of limited popularity for a while, but when he became, Chancellor, when he was, um, you know, in the running for for becoming chancellor, you know, people could have read it and known exactly what he was thinking. I mean, he he had this vision from from very early on. I have to tell a story about Mein Kampf because a few years ago, like maybe ten years ago, um, we had an Austrian exchange student, and uh, he was just such a nice guy. He still calls me every every couple of years. He'll give me a phone call. But um, he, when he was here, he was in his early 20s, he was, uh, he was curious about Mein Kampf because it's banned in Austria. And he had wondered about it, so he asked me, you know, should I, should I read this book? And I said, well, you know, you're old enough to make your own decision. Um, and so he went and he got it um, 
I don't think he got it from the library. He got it from, yeah, he got it from the bookstore. And he went down into our basement guest room and he just disappeared for a whole afternoon and evening. And when he came up, he looked so stunned, like just green about the gills. Like just, he was so shaken by what he was reading in this book. It just, you know, it was just stomach churning to him. And then he was obviously very upset. He said he had nightmares all night. And then he tried to read some more and then he decided he just couldn't. It was too awful. And he didn't know what to do with it because he couldn't bring it back to Austria. So we wound up just throwing it in the trash. Um, anyway, even when I had the book Mein Kampf in my house, I did not read it. Um, and, but, but this book, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, he, he quotes quite extensively from Mein Kampf. Um, so it was out there. What Hitler was was out there. People, people knew what he was about. Um, but after he got arrested for the beer hall pooch, he, um, he decided he was going to go about getting power through the system. He was going to do it legally. And this is where his evil genius really came in. He just understood. First of all, he was a very charismatic speaker. Um, and secondly, he just had this sort of sixth sense about strategy and how to read people. He was absolutely ruthless. He had no scruples whatsoever. Um, he was, you know, he, he just, he was missing, you know, he was talking about sociopath. Um, and he, so he was just cold-bloodedly, strategically reading people, reading the weaknesses, exploiting the weaknesses, sowing confusion. Uh, he just was a master at that. And he slowly, and, and he was patient. He, he was so convinced of his own destiny, you know, that he just patiently kept moving towards the goal, and the, the party really grew under him, uh, and he finally uh, worked his way up to um, being chancellor. I'm at the point in the book, I'm already at 22 minutes, oh my goodness, but I'm at the point in the book where they're just annexing uh, um, Austria, um, and that was so, that was so um, double-crossing, and, and uh, he just, he, first of all, they murdered, what was his name, Dolphus? They murdered the chancellor, the, not, the Austrian Nazis did, and then the guy that they put in, I forget his name, Schausnig or something like that, um, was just too weak to stand up to Hitler's games. Hitler really intimidated him into um, conceding Austria to him. Anyway, that's where I am now. It's a very um, interesting book. The guy is an excellent writer. It moves along really well. The pacing is good. Um, just, just uh, it doesn't feel like a chunkster. You know, it doesn't feel like a, a slog at all. Um, I'm reading it slowly though, because I have to take breaks so that I can read other stuff. It's heavy, you know, it's heavy subject matter. So you have to be in a certain mood, or at least I do. Anyway, so that's my report so far on the rise and fall of the Third Reich. And, um, Hopefully sometime this week and I'll be able to um, make another video on something. I'm hoping to finish uh, Ramallah this weekend. We'll see. We have a lot of stuff going on this weekend, actually, so that may or may not happen. Anyway, take care, and I will talk to you later. Bye.